So we're in section uh, 9.3 today. Conics, and then today our topic is hyperbola. So first off, let me grab a picture, a picture of how we get our hyperbola from a, from a cone. So we remember how, why we call them a conic section. So there's our hyperbola. Um, hyperbolas come from cutting through both sides, both sides of the cone there, both pieces of the cone. And we get a curve traced on either piece of the cone. And those are hy hy hyperbolas. We can cut parallel to the axis of the cone, or we can cut at an angle to the axis of the cone. Um, but our hyperbolas, hyperbolas go through both parts. So just to contrast with a circle, a circle goes comes from cutting perpendicular to the axis. Our ellipse comes from cutting at an angle from the axis, but we're only cutting through one portion of the cone. And our parabola came from cutting parallel to one side of the cone. So we just get the one piece. And then we get a straight line if we cut exactly along the side of the cone. So a straight line is kind of kind of a conic also. So all right. Let's do our load talk about our locus definition. That's how we've been starting every day. Our hyperbola is the locus of points and again a locus is just uh, a collection a set that shares some particular property so locus of points where the difference of the distances from two fixed points and that can go in your little space I, mean, I left a little space on the top of your note sheet there if you wanted to write your definition up there um, two fixed points And what are our fixed points? Our foci, the foci. The difference of the distances is constant. So to contrast with a with an ellipse, the sum of the distances was constant. Or a hyperbola, the difference of the distances is a constant. So what, what that means, if I draw a little sketch here, if we have two branches of our hyperbola, like so, and our foci are here, we're going to find the distance from this particular point x, y on one of the branches of the hyperbola. So I'm going to call that point x, y. And we'll call that distance d1. And we're going to find the distance from the other foci from that point as well. So that distance is going to be d2. d2 minus d1 is a constant. So that's our that's our definition of a of a hyperbola, and what we're going to do is use that definition, and we can use the distance formula to come up with come up with our equations. We're going to write our standard equations for for our hyperbola using this idea. That's where our standard equations come from, and then we're going to work with them a lot like we worked with circles, parabolas, and ellipses. And hopefully, hopefully by now and at, at by the end of 
by the end of the day at, at least, we start seeing that these problems, all the problems we've been doing are extremely similar. Problems we did with circles, problems we did with parabolas, with ellipses, they all are just variations of really one kind of problem. We find A, B, and C. We find P. We find the radius. And they tell us about how far things are apart on these different shapes. But they're really, they're really the same thing, just slight variations. And that's because all of them are conic sections, and their definitions are extremely similar, just have slightly different properties. All right, so let me grab the, the first page of the notes here. we're going to we're going to spend a little time filling out filling out the sheet so this helps us to avoid the skeleton notes helps us to avoid having to draw all of this over and over again so we're talking about what we're talking about is all of these equations we're talking about the standard equation of a of an ellipse or sorry of a hyperbola So let's talk about the parts first, and then we'll get to our equations. Um, so the point right here in the middle, halfway between the foci, is the center, just like we would expect. So we have a focus here and here. These points that are where the, per the hyperbola itself crosses this axis. So the segment, the segment between the foci that contains the center is called the transverse axis, or just the axis. So this axis that goes through the foci and through the center and through each vertex is called the transverse axis. Or often we just call it the axis, the transverse axis or the axis. Where the hyperbola itself crosses the transverse axis, we get vertices. And we can call them the vertices or the transverse vertices. This segment that is perpendicular to our axis or to our transverse axis is called the conjugate axis. And our conjugate axis is a little different than our, our minor axis uh, with an ellipse because our, our curve doesn't cross the conjugate axis. We have these points here. B still tells us about these particular points on the conjugate axis. We call these points the conjugate vertices. And this point down here is a conjugate vertex as well. And what this, what the conjugate vertex allows us to do with a hyperbola is find the equation of the asymptotes. Hyperbolas have asymptotes. So we have our transverse axis, or just our axis. We have our center, our vertices, or our transverse vertices, our foci, our conjugate axis, and our conjugate vertices. All right, so let's write our equation. Are we good with our parts? Our equation for a horizontal hyperbola, so our transverse axis, our axis is, is horizontal, x minus h squared over a squared minus y minus b, sorry, y minus k squared over b squared equals 1. 
The only difference in the in the equation, in the form of the equation between a hyperbola and an ellipse is this minus sign. Our center is still at the point HK. Our transverse vertices, A, tells us how far left and right from the center to move to get to our vertices, just like an ellipse. So we're going to go H plus or minus A, K. A tells us how far to move left and right to get to our transverse vertices. Conjugate vertices, B tells us how far up and down to move to get to our conjugate vertices. So we're going to be at the point H, K, plus or minus B. Our eccentricity is still C over A. For an ellipse, the eccentricity is greater than 1. Our asymptotes. Our asymptotes always go through the center. So I'm going to write this, write the asymptotes in point slope form. So they go through the point HK. So in point slope form we get Y minus K equals, and I get two slopes, so I'm going to say a plus and a minus. The easy way to figure out the slope of the asymptotes, the rise is B and the run is A. So plus or minus B over A X minus H. So that would be our equation in point slope form. And I think that's the easiest way to remember it because it goes through the center. The, the asymptotes always go through the center. And the foci, C tells us how far left and right to move from the center to get to the foci. So we're going to be at H plus or minus C. Okay. So all of those things, A, B, and C, give us the same information that they do about they, that, that they do about the ellipse. It's just we have a slightly different thing going on with a hyperbola than with an ellipse. And then for the for the vertical hyperbola, we're just going to really we, we're switching the kind of we're switching the x's and the y's around. So our equation for our vertical transverse axis becomes y minus k squared over a squared minus x minus h squared over b squared equals 1. Our center is still at hk, the point hk. Our transverse vertices, now we're moving up and down from the center to get to our transverse vertices. So I'm going to be at h, k plus or minus a. A tells us how far to move up and down to the vertical hyperbola. Conjugate vertices, I'm moving left and right. So I get h plus or minus b, k. Eccentricity, same thing. C over A, greater than 1. Our asymptotes, they go through the center again. So in point slope form, Y minus K equals, this time the rise is A and the run is B. So plus or minus A over B times X minus H. In foci, C tells us how far up and down from the center to go to get to the foci. So I'm going to be at H, K, plus or minus C. All right, so looking at these equations, what are a couple of things that we, a couple of things that we notice about these equations that might help us think about hyperboles? One of your hints here is for both types, A is always 
right? A is half the distance to the vertex from the vertex to the vertex, so that tells us something about the graph. I'm thinking if we look at the equation, so that, that is true, and that will help us graph these, graph these things. Looking at the equations, so if we were looking at these equations, just to pick out A and B from our equation. Matthew? Never mind. A is always with the positive part of the equation. So here A is with the positive part, here A is with the positive part. So I'm going to say A is always with the positive term. So that's how we're going to pick out A with a hyperbola. Where with, with an ellipse, A was always the bigger number. Um, so we can tell whether our, thinking, thinking along those lines, we can tell whether our, our ellipse is horizontal or vertical based on what? whether x or y is positive. If the x part is positive, then my transverse axis is going to be horizontal. I think parallel to the x. If the y part is positive, then the transverse axis is vertical, parallel to the y. So I'm going to say based on if x or y term is positive. positive term tells us which coordinate axis our transverse axis parallel to. Now for an ellipse, we said because of the because of its shape, the way it's the way it works, that A is always larger. Looking at this the hyperbola, what quantity is going to be the largest quantity here are, are, are numbers that we deal with for a hyperbola. Here's A, here's B, and here's C. C is going to be the larger quantity. For a hyperbola, C is greater than A. The other important piece of information that we need is, is how to find C from A and B. For a hyperbola, C squared equals A squared plus B squared. And the way you can remember that, a helpful way to remember that, is if you draw a little triangle right here, that side is B. This side, or sorry, this side is A, this side is B, the hypotenuse is C. So you can draw that little triangle, same thing over here, I just didn't want to draw it over here because we put a bunch of stuff over there. And this is a 90 degree angle. So C squared equals A squared plus B squared for, for a hyperbola. So these quantities are going to be very important for a hyperbola, just like for an ellipse, a squared equals b squared plus c squared was important, and we knew that a was greater than b. So our equations, almost like an ellipse, we're going to work with these equations almost exactly like we worked with the equations for ellipses. The same kinds of things. Use, use the equations to pick out a, b, and c. Use a, b, and c to figure out the location of things on the graph, and, and work, work with them that way. So it, are we all good with the with the equations? Then this is why I like this is why I like ellipses better. With hyperbolas, you have these asymptotes, you have all this other stuff going on outside of them. Ellipses are nice; everything's inside. They're all self-contained. It's like a light, nice little like Easter egg. Everything's inside. That's just my personal preference. All right. So on the bottom on the bottom of your note sheet, um, it says. Uh, it says something about your distances. Um, let me grab, let me grab that one.
so our distances. So all this is asking us about our A, A B, and C, our distances. So our distances from the center to the transverse vertex, or from the center to the vertex. What, what portion of our equation gives us a distance from the center to the vertex? A. So A. That's what that is. What, what portion of our equation gives us the distance from the center to the conjugate vertex? B. And from the center to the foci? C. So that's all that's it. That's <coughs> reminding us. And that's the same for uh, vertical or horizontal ellipses. All right, so what I want to do next is just go through a couple of examples working with these. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Working with these equations, just like we did with ellipses, just like we did with parabolas, just going through a couple of, a couple of problems. Then I want to talk about, briefly talk about a general equation for, for a, conic, uh, a conic section and how we tell whether we have a parabola, a circle, an ellipse, or a hyperbola, and a little bit about how we can rotate so our axes aren't always either on the uh, vertical or horizontal, how we can rotate. And I also want to mention the reflective properties of a hyperbola. Hyperbolas have some interesting reflective properties. All right, a couple of examples. Uh, let's say we have our foci at negative 1, 2, 5, 2. And our vertices at 0, 2, and at 4, 2. We want to write uh, vertices, because I need a T in there. We want, our, we want our standard equation. And we want to sketch a graph. And I just want to go back really quickly to our to our drawing. Oops. Uh, do this. Back really quickly. So when we sketch our graph, we're unless the problem asks us to find the equations of the asymptotes, we don't really need the equations to sketch the graph. What we're going to do is draw this little box. So the length of this side is going to be 2a, and the length of this side is going to be 2b. So we'll draw that little box connecting the vertices and the conjugate vertices. And then our, our asymptotes are going to go through the center and through the corners of that box. So that's how we're going to draw our asymptotes. So unless, we, unless the problem asks us to find the equations, we're going to draw this little box with dimensions 2a, 2b, and 2a. Just wanted to mention that. All right, here's, here's, here's our problem. So let's start, let's start our sketch of our graph. I'm going to do a rough sketch over here. All right, so our foci are at negative 1, 2, and 5, And our vertices are at 0, 2, and at 4, 2. So if we weren't told ahead of time what kind of conic section this was, we, we're, we kind of assume because we're in the hyperbola section that this is a hyperbola, how would we know from this information that this is a hyperbola and not an ellipse? The foci is outside of the vertices. So for an ellipse, the vertices are on the outside. Everything that we're interested in is inside the ellipse. Here, our vertices are, I'll we'll mark our vertices in red. Our vertices are the red points, and our foci are the black points. So our foci are outside the vertices. That would be our clue that we have an ellipse. All right, well, we can already start writing our equation. Almost. Where is the center of this hyperbola? 
What is it? 2, 2. The center is halfway between the vertices or halfway between the foci. The point that's halfway between those two points is 2, 2. So I'll mark that in blue. So our center <coughs> is 2, 2. From our, from our points that we've graphed there, we know that we have a horizontal axis. So now we can start writing our equation. Um, x minus 2 squared over something minus y minus 2 squared over something equals 1. So we're almost, we're almost done with our equation. So what numbers can we figure out just from what we have here? A is A equals 2 from the center to the vertices, 2 units, so A equals 2. A is always under the positive part, so x minus 2 squared over 4. What other part can we figure out from, from our points here? C equals, what is it? From the center to a foci, center to a focus. 3, and we know for a, for a hyperbola, c squared equals a squared plus b squared. So 9 equals, what did I say, a equals a here? Yeah. A equals 4. A equals a, we're pretty sure of that, right? A equals, a equals 2. A squared equals 4. So 9 equals uh, 4 plus b squared. I solve this and I get b equals square root of 5, or we could say b squared equals 5. So this part is 5. And there's my, there's my equation. And now we can, start to, we can start to sketch our graph. We can sketch in our box for our asymptotes. I'm going to make uh, through the vertices going to make my little box here. The length of those sides of the box are going to be 2b, 2 times the square root of 5. The square root of 5 is between uh, 2 and 3, right? A little bigger than 2. 2 points, so I'm going to go up um, 1, 2, a little more than 2 units. So my box would be about like this. And I'm going to go down a little more than two units. So my box would go along like so. And I would sketch in my asymptotes here. So I'd go through the corner of the box. I know my, I said this is going to be a rough sketch. So those would be my asymptotes. And my hyperbola would go through the vertex towards the asymptotes. So there would be a rough sketch of my hyperbola. And we call each of these two pieces the branches, the two branches of the hyperbola. And we could find the equation, the equation of the asymptotes. We know it goes through the center, so our asymptotes, if it did ask us for the, for the equations, we would, I would write in point slope form, so y minus 2 equals plus or minus, the rise is b, the run is a, so plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2, x minus 2. Those would be the equations of our asymptotes. Are we good with that example? Same, same kind of, same kind of uh, process we went through the other ones. Do this really quickly. It's too early.
Um, all right, let's look at one more example. Um, so let's say we want to uh, find the center. Vertices, foci, and sketch for x squared minus 3y squared plus 8x plus 16 equals 0. So before we, before we do anything here, let's, let's pretend that we don't know what kind of shape this is. How would we? How can we get some information before we even start working about this, about what this thing is going to be? John? So we have a one positive sign and one negative sign, so it's going to be a hyperbola because these two aren't the same. Um, we know the numbers in front of the x and the y are different, so that's going to tell us it can't be a can't be a circle. We have two squares, two square terms, so that tells us it can't be a, what would we get if we only had one square term? Parabola. So we have two square terms, so it's not a parabola. All right, what do we need to do here? We need to complete the square. So let me group, group the x and y terms. 4x squared, and something interesting happens with this one, this is kind of a nice example. 4x squared plus 8x minus 3y squared equals negative 16. So I don't have a, anything to go with this y. I need to factor out this 4. I'm going to write this as 4x squared plus 2x minus 3y squared equals negative 16. Complete the square here, so I get 4x squared divide this 2 by 2, I get 1. 1 squared is 1. 3y squared equals negative 16. This is 4x plus 1 squared. Oh, and did I, did I forget something? I forgot to add my part here. So I remember to distribute the 4 to the 1. So I'm adding 4 to this side. So I'm going to add 4 to that side. Negative 16 plus 4 is negative 12. I need to write it in standard form. So I want a 1 on this side, so I'm going to divide everything by 12. So I get x plus 1 squared, negative x plus 1 squared over 3, plus y squared over 4 equals 1. It's kind of, kind of interesting that the x, the, the part where the negative was, switched around. So my equation to write it in standard form y squared over 4 minus x plus 1 squared over 3 equals 1. Well, now we're home free. We're almost done. The problem is just about done. What can we pick out here? Our center. What is our center? Negative 1, 0. What else do we know here? A equals 2, B equals the square root of 3, and from that I can find C. C comes out to be C squared equals, let's be careful, A squared plus B squared. So C squared equals 4 plus 3 equals 7, so C equals the square root of 7. All right, so our, we have our center, our vertices. Um, uh, is this hyperbola, does it have a horizontal or a vertical transverse axis? Vertical transverse axis. Do we have a vertical axis? Vertical axis, 
My vertices are two units up and down from the center. So our center is at negative one plus or minus two. The foci are C units up and down from the center. So negative one plus or minus the square root of seven. Our transverse vertices are our co-vertices. Now I mean our conjugate vertices or co-vertices. Our uh, B units left and right from the center. So negative one plus or minus the square root of three zero. What's that? Oh, sorry, this, I wanted this to be the vertex. So we're moving, we're moving up and down two units from the center. And then we could use that information to, to draw our sketch. So I'm not going to sketch this one. I think we'll, we'll do okay sketching these. But this would be our, this would be our information for our sketch. And just, just so we're clear, I'm not sure exactly which terms the book uses. The conjugate vertices and the co-vertices are the same thing. We can call them the co-vertices or the conjugate vertices. All right, questions on that again? All right. Um, I want to talk about the general equation for a conic section and then the reflective properties of uh, hyperbola and then I have a little demonstration. So a general conic. Our general equation for a conic is going to have all of our x squared terms, all of our y squared terms, and a little bit more. So we're going to have, for a general equation of a conic, I have ax squared plus c y squared plus b x y and this x y term is going to do something interesting b x y plus d x plus e y plus f equals zero that is a general equation for a conic and depending on which pieces we have and how big the numbers are, we get different conic sections. If we have an xy term, an xy term rotates the conic. So our axis is not horizontal and our axis isn't vertical, it rotates the conic. Anybody think of a, of a rotated conic section that we've done some work with over the course of the year? And I'll give you a hint, it's a hyperbola. How about y equals 1 over x? If I multiply both sides by x, I get xy equals 1. I could subtract one from both sides and I would get an equation in this form. This equation looks like this. This is a, a hyperbola rotated 45 degrees and our asymptotes are the x and y axis. So this is a rotated hyperbola, x, y equals 1. So that's one that we, we're a little bit familiar with. In general, we can tell which shape we have, and we talked about it a little bit. If um, A equals C, so if the number in front of the X squared and Y squared are the same, what kind of conic do we have? Circle. Circle. If, um, if I multiply If AC equals zero, 
So that means one of these two numbers is zero. What conic section do I have? If either, if I have no x squared term or no y squared term. Parabola. If AC is positive, so that means either both of these are positive or both of them are negative. What kind of conic section would I have? An ellipse. If both of these are the same sign, we end up with an ellipse. And then finally, the only one we're left with, if AC is negative, we have a hyperbola. So that means one of these is negative and one is positive. And if we have a BX term, that's just going to take whatever that conic section is and rotate it somehow. The algebra for coming up with the equation of a rotated conic is very, not difficult, just very tedious and it's very easy to make a mistake. So we're not, gonna, we're not really going to work with that. We we're familiar with x, y equals 1, y equals 1 over x. So this is how we tell what kind of conic section we have if we just have an equation written out. All right, quickly, the reflective properties, just so, so, just so you know about these. The way that a, uh, a hyperbola, the reflective properties of a hyperbola work is, and I'm going to make this one dotted. So what I'm going to do is direct light, sound, radio waves, something at one of the foci. So if this light, whatever, is directed towards this foci, this hyperbola will reflect it to the other foci. And it works on the other side, other side of the foci, other side of the hyperbola as well. If I direct light, sound, whatever, radio waves at that foci, it's going to reflect back to the other foci. So we can reflect off either side. So they use hyperbolic mirrors, sometimes they use hyperbolic mirrors and telescopes to, uh, to redirect the light. And they also, hyperbolic, hyperbolic collectors, uh, satellite dishes, sometimes satellite dishes are hyperbolic shapes. Uh, when our signals are coming kind of from the same distance, so they're not coming from really, really, really far away, like a telescope, like a telescope reflector. So they they would use these reflective properties of a hyperbola for, for those kinds of those kinds of situations. So we, they do make reflectors and mirrors and things hyperbolic shape. All right, are we good with hyperbola? Okay, uh, homework, and then I have another little demonstration. I'm going to take 49 off. Don't do 49. Actually, I, I did I did that one. Earlier. All right, there we go. 